Here we go, gonna go live. Tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello everybody, Bob Lusk, the Palm Boss, coming at you live from Pecan Plantation in Lusk Lodge, actually Lusk Landing, comma three. And there goes the music again. I gotta learn how to play this game someday. I've only been doing this like four years, right? So, uh, welcome. Holy cow, a lot of stuff going on. I've got a pretty fun topic tonight that I wanna share with you guys. Looks like we got quite a few folks checking in already. Nick Kajewski, Lonnie, uh, Lonnie Mizell. Hi Lonnie, Mike Cook from North Carolina. I'm gonna talk about North Carolina a little bit here in a minute. I kinda gotta get myself set up here cause I'm running behind. I walked through the door literally 30 seconds ago. <laughs> Just bumped into one of our um, one of our viewers, Patrick Clayton, who lives out here where we live. Debbie and I just had dinner up at the 19th hole, which is a pretty cool little spot here in Pecan Plantation. Hey, Mike McPherson, Ron Worthy, good to see you. Danny Mack checking in. Hey, John Elmer, Wyatt checking in. Wyatt Cunninger, Greg Easley, good to see you guys. I'm gonna to try to see if I can get this up where I can see what's going on here. Oh, there it is, here we go. Now I can see it, kinda, of, sorta. Of. Anyway, I've got a pretty cool topic, I think. I think, I think you're gonna like it. I got to talk with Tommy Leininger today from uh, around um, close to Sanford, North Carolina. He just recently moved to a, into a homeowners association where there's an 80 acre lake and the lake is, Maybe not the best lake, that according to his uh, his terms. And I got to visit with him for as I drove today, probably for 45 minutes. So I thought that would make a really good topic about what's going on. So there's Tommy. Yep, Tommy's listening in. So Tommy, you can chime in anytime you want to. There's Kenny Sanderson. Good to see Kenny checking in from Northwest Kansas. So uh, if I see you guys, I'll greet you. And if you have questions, bring those. Now, you guys know the drill. Troy Todd's already done it. So is Mark Dyer. Finally got some moisture in Nebraska, he says. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comment section. Click like or that little heart thing. Let me see some hearts come up here in the corner over here. Well, there's, there's a like. Somebody show me a heart somewhere. <laughs> and, uh. Share this to your timeline. There's one. There it comes. I see it. That's great. And you'll be eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat and probably one of my books. Yep, that's what we're going to do. I want to give away a book. This is a $29.95 value. Pretty funny story about this. I was talking to Debbie right after I finished this book and I said, uh, I said and it's, this is written in there. I said, honey, What's it like sleeping with an author? She says, well, you know, it's pretty good. What's it like selling everything you know for 30 bucks? Says, oh, never mind. Let's, let's have some coffee or something. So uh, I hope we can have a lot of fun tonight and talk about some cool topics. John Elmer ordered the book. They ship on Tuesdays. Yes, they do. Hi, Kim Moore. Michael Gray checking in from, um, let's see. Michael's checking in from Nashville, Tennessee. Kim Moore, Indiana or Illinois. Gosh, Kim, I'm sorry. I should know that. Mike Cottrell from um, Palapinto County. Chuck Brinkman, Miranda, Elena, and Dad checking in there from Missouri. Hey, there's Fred Bingham and checking in from Brownstown, Illinois or St. Louis. Fred, I have got you a bottle of something that I wanted to bring to you this last week, but I kind of got derailed. So uh, I got something for you one of these days. David Schneiderman, Easy Docs of Texas. Good to see David, longtime sponsor of this show. Christy Berg from Logan, Kansas. We got all kinds of Kansans here today. So Tommy and I, Tommy, I guess he found, somebody found out about Palm Boss and then he bought some books and he started looking at some of the YouTube videos that we've done in the past. So he thought, you know what? Let me see if I can just, hunt down that guy. So he emailed me with a bunch of questions and I thought, you know what, it would be better to have a conversation than to try to type all these answers. So Tommy and I had a conversation. So about two months ago, Tommy moved into a lake. He, if he, he can tell you whatever he wants to tell you about the lake, but it's in North Carolina, not far from Lake Almond, which is a 
renowned lake, which is an eight or 900 acre lake. I've actually talked to people about that lake in the past just to kind of share some of my thoughts. But Tommy is trying to figure out ways he can help manage the lake where he just moved. And I, I, don't, I didn't ask him how many members there are, but there's a handful of people that fish and this 80 acre lake is over a little over 20 years old. So they recently had the lake analyzed, an electrofishing survey and some water chemistry stuff done with Foster Lake Management Company out of, um, oh, they're near Garner, uh, North Carolina. Well, Johnny Foster is one of those guys that's been in it just about as long as I have. I met Johnny, first time I talked to Johnny Foster was like in 1983, 84, and we figured out that we were running parallel courses toward what we didn't know, you know? <laughs> So he was doing pond management work over there in North Carolina, and I was working in Texas. And back then, just in Texas, there were like three guys that were figuring out that we could actually make a living doing what we were passionate about and try to create our niches in the pond management business. And Johnny Foster was doing the same thing. Well, here we, here we are fast forward four decades, and Johnny's created a really outstanding company uh, got great people working with him and working for him. And they did an analysis of the lake where Tommy lives. So, Tommy, you can chime in anytime you want to. Of course, I don't know if I can invite you in to talk, but, you know, which we didn't talk about that. I'm not going to worry about it. But you could throw some things out there to think about. So here, Tommy, Tommy wasn't sure that he had a lot of confidence in the, what the survey said. So I had him go over the report with me and... The, the, the fundamental report was, here, here was the data. I'm going to throw this out there, and you guys can think about this. Largemouth bass, they collected with an electrofishing survey. I didn't ask him how long they were on the pedal, how long they were electrofishing, but they captured 105 bass in this 80-acre lake. They weighed and measured every one of them, and 100 of those bass were smaller than 12 inches and underweight. The other five were 18, 19, 20 inches, and they looked pretty good. Their bluegill numbers were low. They captured some red ear sunfish that were pretty good size, actually big enough to catch. They captured a few bluegills big enough to catch, but they only they didn't see a lot of small bluegills. So the small bluegill numbers were low. They captured a few warmouth sunfish, and they captured um, suckers bullheads, and a few channel catfish. So when he, when he goes out there fishing, Tommy's catch rates were a little low. So he was thinking that maybe that the survey numbers might not jive with what his catch rates were saying. So in other words, when, you, when he goes out and catches, when they're saying your bass are overcrowded, well, Tommy's evidence suggested that they're not overcrowded because my catch rates are not that good. And they're, you know, the anglers and the surveyors saying, well, we got a whole lot of these bass smaller than 12 inches, a lot of 9 and 10 inch bass that are underweight, but my catch records don't show that. I'm not catching big numbers of those. So we started talking about, we start talking about water chemistry. Well, one of the recommendations was to lime the lake because the pH is like 6.3 alkalinity is 27 parts per million. So the alkalinity is a little bit low. Now, it's not fatally low, you know, to, used to 20 parts per million was our kind of our go-to number to make sure we have happy water. Now, those of you, and, 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 and Miranda and Elena know this, so everybody else needs to know this. What do we start with? Girls, you red-headed girls, speak it up, talk loud. First thing is happy water, that's right, I heard them, they said it, I can hear them all the way in Texas. Happy water. Then the next thing is that we study is habitat. And the third thing is the food chain because it takes 10 pounds of bait fish to grow one pound of game fish. It takes 10 pounds of insects and small fish to grow one pound of bait fish. So it's a 10 to one conversion. So you gotta manage your food chain. The fourth piece of the puzzle is genetics. That's right, you guys are listening. And the fifth piece of the puzzle is a harvest plan. You know, so those are the fundamentals to create a, a pond management or a lake management strategy. So as Tommy and I were talking, one of the things I asked him is, tell me about, tell me about the water chemistry. So that's when we talked about pH 6.3, 
alkalinity is 27 parts per million. Per million. Uh, Foster's Lake Management recommended uh, fertile, uh, um, adding lime to the lake. That's to get the alkalinity up. Then the next thing is that they recommended was you need to start calling some bass. You need to start taking some bass out. So as I listened to him and studied the data with him a little bit, it sounded like there was a whole lot of bass, you know, like that and very few like that and nothing in the middle. So when you've got those missing size classes between the small fish and the bigger fish, that is a sure sign that the bass are crowded. Now here's where it gets a little bit complicated, but I'm going to make it simple. His catch rates are low because the standing crop is low. <laughs> So if the lake can only produce 25 or 30 pounds of bass per acre because the water's not as happy as it should be and there's not enough habitat, then you can pretty well expect that the standing crop of bass is going to be a little bit lower than it could be. So I said, what kind of habitat is there? He says, well, when they built the lake, they built it kind of like a bowl. So it's not, you know, it, there wasn't a lot of habitat in the lake. Now, they did leave some standing timber, but they cut it off where there's stumps under the water. So, as I was kind of, as, as, as I listened to Tommy, I was trying to kind of take all these, I look at this as, as pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, and the picture of that puzzle is how the lake is, why is it like that, and what can we add to that puzzle to make that lake like we want it to be. So, that's where my thought process was going on. So um, look at there. There's Bruce Candelo. He's he's chiming in. That's good. Yep. Okay. So yep. I'm gonna get to that here. There's John Moore from Kentucky. Okay. So um, oh my gosh, you guys are kicking in. I'm not watching some of this stuff. Holy cow, this is super. I'm gonna back up a little bit. I'm missing some things here. Let's see here. Drew Schmidt, Auburn, Kansas. Danny Mack. As our peak daily temperatures hit near 100, I watch the air temperature inline power controller cutoff aeration. At about 88 degrees. That's a brilliant move. You've got to do that. Christopher Aguilar, chicken in from South Louisiana. Mike Fornash, you got the drill here, guys. Drew Schmidt, got it. Low structure in our lake, clear water. Tommy, okay, now, Justin is asking, no habitat, minimal habitat. So one of the conversations, or one of the topics in the conversation when I was asking Tommy is, do you guys, do you have a, a bathymetry map? Do you have a contour map of the basin of the lake? He said, yes, we do. So I said, pull that out and start plotting your catch rates. Now, I'm going to tell you guys this. If you have a lake where your catch rates are kind of weird and your fish aren't growing like they should, how do you solve that? So in, in this report that uh, Foster sent, they were saying, okay, you need to lie on the lake so they want the water to be more happy. It was, your bass are crowded, but they're crowded for the conditions. So what Tommy is saying is he'd fished overcrowded bass lakes his entire life. So that information really wasn't clicking with him because what he hasn't probably fished are, are low productivity lakes. So, he, you know, the productivity is based on fertility, alkalinity, which feeds the food chain, which feeds the next level, which feeds the fish, so you can have the best standing crop or carrying capacity that that water can provide. Like, let's just take Chuck Brinkman and his girls. They have got a pond that's smaller than an acre, and it is packed to the gills with fish. It's because their alkalinity is good, but he's out there every day like clockwork feeding those fish. He's making sure he's got the right kind of food and that he's got happy water, which he's, we've, we've had that conversation before. He's had to deal with that before and he'll have to deal with it again. So girls, tell dad, deal with, make sure we have happy water. Y'all do that for me. Tell dad, happy water. And I'm going to pour myself a little adult beverage while we're talking here. So, uh, there's about one finger of something that my wife bought that's really good. So as, as we were talking about these things, what, I started, one of the suggestions I made was take that bathymetry map and get with several, he said there's not many people that like to fish the lake because fishing's not that good. Well, if fishing was good, there'd be more anglers. You know, why fish a lake that sucks? Make it unsuck. So here's what I told him. Go get that bathymetry map and then start plotting where your catches are. 
If you catch a three pound bass, put a little X right there, you know, that's in green. If you catch stunted bass, put little X's right there in red. And then you can start tracking and seeing where the fish are congregating. And if you've got a contour map, then you can look at that map and look at your catch rates where you're catching fish. And then you give those spots, you'll see those spots on the map. Give them an A. You grade them an A. And then there's other areas where we're going to catch fish from time to time. Mark those with a B. Then there'll be a few other places where, yeah, you might catch fish, you might not. Those are C spots. Then you go into all the A spots and enhance them. And what Tommy was telling me today is that one of his hot spots, or several of his hot spots, is where there's some vertical cover. And that's all they have in that lake is vertical cover. But if you take that vertical cover and you enhance it with some mossback fish attractors or American fish tree or Christmas trees or cedar or brush piles or some some diagonal timber that you push over the side of the boat and anchor right there, then you're going to increase that habitat's opportunity to attract fish to it. So attracting fish is going to increase your catch rates, but adding the lime and monitoring your water chemistry, that's going to increase the productivity. And then as you're starting to cull some of these small bass, then what you're going to do is start increasing the dynamics and increasing the sizes of the bass that are left. But here's where it gets really, really fun. How many do you take out? You know, so Foster recommended harvesting all bass under 12 inches. I haven't read the report, but what I'm going to tell you is an 80 acre lake, if you take out 20 bass per acre, that's a good start. 1,600 bass out of an 80 acre lake. Now, what I expect to happen in, in a truly highly productive lake, highly productive meaning the water's happy, the habitat's pretty good, and the bass are still crowded. What that means to me is that is that you can remove 20 bass per acre from a highly productive lake, and it's probably not enough. But if you take out 20 from a bass that's productive, I mean from a lake that's that's the productivity's kind of low then you're gonna see a difference fairly quickly. You'll start to see, the example I gave Tommy today, I said, okay, when you go out and you catch 30 bass today, odds are that all 30 of those bass are 12 inches and under and they're skinny. Take them all out. Then you go out in another month after you and the other anglers have been harvesting some fish and you catch 30 bass and 28 of them are skinny and two of them are gaining weight. Well, maybe you throw those two chunk fish back in there and harvest the 28. Then we fast forward six months after some culling and you catch 30 bass and 20 of them are skinny and 10 of them are gaining weight. That's how you know you're gaining on that fishery. Now what typically happens is as you're in a lake like this, when you've got that many bass that are underweight and there's a big gap between the 12 inch bass and, and five pound bass, for example, or four pound bass, there are no pound and a half, two, two and a half, or three pound bass. There's a gap in, in size classes that typically means that those bass that are 12 inches and smaller are old. So their growth potential is limited. That doesn't mean they won't grow, but what it does mean is their maximum size has been tapped out because they haven't had enough food for the last three or four years to gain the weight that they should have gained had they had plenty of food and less competition. So that's, that's the kind of the gist of that. So as you start culling those bass and taking them out, what you're going to see happen is remaining bass are going to grow, but wait, remember Ron Popeil with his pocket fisherman? There's more. <laughs> what happens is young of the year bass will outgrow those skinny, thin bass that are just beginning to gain weight, and you'll start to see some young bass popping into that slot that you're harvesting. That's where discernment begins to come in. That's a big deal at church, but it's also a big deal in your lake. And since we're preaching from the book of Pond Boss in this new New Testament, I want you to take this home. Is as you begin to harvest those bass that are overcrowded, you do want to preserve the bass that are remaining that are gaining weight. And you'll see it in their girth and their weight compared to their length. 
But even better yet, you'll start seeing some six, seven, eight inch bass that look like little footballs. Those are the freshman team just about to pop into the next size classes. Let's see, I just got a text from Matt Marsden. He's got a product that he's, I'm getting, uh, Matt, I want to talk to you tomorrow. Call me tomorrow, dude. I've got a guy that wants to try your floating structure. He's got some, Matt uh, with American Fish Tree has got some structure that is buoyant and you can anchor it in deep water at the level that you want. And I've got a couple of guys that want some of that. So anyway, where, where I'm going is, is that over the long haul, you are promoting the growth of the younger fish that are coming into that system because those are going to be the ones with the best growth potential. So now one thing Tommy and I didn't really talk about is if you guys in a lake that's been overcrowded with bass, even with low productivity, and when I say productivity, I'm talking about production like a garden, not production like an angler. Okay, I'm talking about how much that garden is producing. So if, if uh, as you increase that productivity and you get those crowded bass numbers down and you get the food chain built back up, then you can actually, it'd be smart to go buy some fish that have better genetics that are young that you can stock into that system for the long haul, like some F1 tiger bass in North Carolina. That's a good idea. Not a good idea now because they'd be a snack. So as you get your water happy, and your food chain begins to change as you're culling some bass, that's when you're going to make room for more fish to grow, and you're going to get your productivity up. Now, there's some other pieces to this puzzle. And, and uh, one of the recommendations that Foster made was stock 2,000 pounds of golden shiners. Well, that they make that recommendation because, and, and I concur with that for this reason. I concur with that because... The golden shiners thrive in open water, and since they don't have a lot of structure and habitat that's conducive to bluegills, for example, golden shiners are a good way to, to provide some bait fish immediately, and then over the long haul, as the bluegills begin to recharge themselves. Well, bluegill are going to need water with good alkalinity. They're going to need spawning beds. They're gonna need dense cover so the babies can hide. And one of the recommendations that Foster made was to stock some two to three inch bluegills. While I agree with that, I, I, I think the timing is important because if you go right now and you put those two to three inch bluegill in, you're gonna have a fairly high mortality rate because they're gonna get eaten. So job one, work on the water. Job two, improve habitat. Improve habitat and think about your bait fish as much as you think about your bass. If you get your bait fish habitat in order where bluegills can spawn more and you've got places adjacent to your spawning beds where the bluegills spawn, where there's some density where they can hide. And density, think, think Christmas trees, cedar trees, brush piles. Think beaver lodge. Don't invite a beaver, but I'm talking just density. That's where baby bluegills can go and and grow and become become something more than just a little nugget. They can become a source of food, you know? And so when you do that, as you're culling bass, then you're going to see your food chain go up. So, so here's what's going on with that lake. Productivity's here. Bass are crowded, food chains like that. If you increase the lake's ability to produce fish with happy water, your, pro your productivity goes like this. Then as you reduce the bass numbers, then the food chain will go like so, and you'll start to see the uh, game fish, the bass, begin to gain weight again. And when you do those things, you'll start to see a fishery that can really thrive like Chuck Brinkman's got. Now Chuck keeps this propped up with fish food. Speaking of fish food, one of the recommendations Foster made for uh, Tommy and his cohorts is to buy three or four Texas hunter feeders and feed Purina's Aquamax fish food MVP. Well, that's a good idea. And Tommy was saying, well, how many, I mean, the Lake Almond's only got three feeders on 800 acres. Well, all those feeders on 800 acres do is they feed a localized population of fish that influences that part of the lake. On an 80 acre lake, 
Feeder companies recommend one feeder for every eight acres. I recommend one for every three or four acres. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, one for every five acres. Nobody wants to feed, excuse me, nobody wants to feed that much fish food in an 80 acre lake. But feeding fish food does a couple of things. It's gonna take that local population of fish and you're gonna get some feed hogs. So you're gonna grow some bigger bluegill, some more um, uh, golden shiners. You're gonna see the catfish begin to come and eat that fish food. And then you're gonna to start to see that local population of fish gaining weight and the bluegill are gonna have more babies. Now, one of the questions he had for me is, are these channel catfish, are they competing with bass? Absolutely, yes, they do. You know, people think channel catfish are scavengers. By far, they're not scavengers at all. They are teenagers. They're teenage boys. They're going to go to the refrigerator, open it up, looking for meat. God dang, there's no meat. Yogurt, I don't know. Vegetables, eh. So they're going to eat whatever they can. Where channel catfish, a three-pound channel catfish is going to compete with a one pound bass for food, you know? And I'm not against them, I, I love catfish. That's one of my favorite fish to eat. But if you're trying to manage a bass lake, it might be wise to be culling all your catfish that are five pounds and bigger because they're competing with your bigger bass. You know, so they've got that dynamic going on too. So there's kind of the gist of this whole conversation we had today, kind of summed up in 20 minutes of a, of a little diatribe here. But the bottom line is, happy water, take that map that you have and start to give it, give areas on the map a grade based on fish you catch, enhance those areas, make them better. One thing we also talked about, he asked me, he says, what, does it make sense to have Foster come back out with their electric fishing boat and harvest some bass? Yes, it does. It sure does. It makes great sense to do that because when you electrofish a lake that is crowded with bass for its productivity, then that shocker boat, electrofishing boat, is a, is a random sampler where if you're going to try to catch all those fish by angling, odds are you're going to reduce the numbers of your most aggressive bass, and that's an inherited trait. You know, so think about things like that. Um, so... You know, to kind of summarize this conversation, it was uh, focus on the water, improve habitat, catch overcrowded bass, ramp up your food chain, think about genetics when it's time, and keep pushing that harvest program. Now, here's where it got a little bit complicated. Liming the lake was going to cost over way up into five figures. Stocking golden shiners, five figures. Stocking bluegill, five figures. You know, and when you start looking at that, that's a budget that could ex get knocked on the door of $100,000. So even though all those recommendations were solid, if you are the one that got this report and now you got to wade through it and decide what we can do and what we can't do, what we should do, what we shouldn't do. And let's just say the budget, let's say their budget's 10 grand and, and if they make a cash call from some folks with means, they might get it up to 20. What do you do with $20,000 on an 80 acre lake? Well, the, the liming recommendation was to use calces which is easy applied, uh, works great, expensive. So is there another method? Can you apply some ag lime like the farmers do in the sand hills where they're gonna cut hay in North Carolina? You know, maybe you can, so explore that. Then do you really have to have 2,000 pounds of shiners or should you focus your efforts on habitat improvement? You know, so if you can get your water happy for eight or nine or ten thousand dollars, and then you can begin culling some bass and maybe have Foster come out a couple of times and electrofish and cull some bass, get the bass numbers down as you get your water's productivity up, add the bluegills, add some golden shiners. Now you're beginning to have a game plan that makes pretty good sense that also fits into your budget. Now what I'm gonna 
tell guys like Tommy and, and however many of his running buddies are watching this show tonight, is you guys get your heads together, figure out the budget, and then sort through that report and see what makes the most sense to you and prioritize that. And then call Mitchell Morton or Johnny Foster and you guys get your heads together and say, okay, here's our budget. What makes the most sense? You know, and it, it could be that, that the liming makes good sense. It could be, let's drill into a uh, habitat, get that going. And then at the same time, let's be calling some, some bass. And while we're doing that, let's see what, how the remaining bluegills respond to that. And let's stock some, let's stock, a, let's stock some golden shiners and let's stock some bluegill as we get our productivity up. So all that can make really, really, really good sense. While all the recommendations are solid, you may not have 100 grand or 60 grand or 85 or whatever it is. Figure out what you have and then what makes the most sense now and then set up a timeline to do all these other things. So that's the way I'm gonna leave that right now. I'm gonna scroll down here and see if we got any questions. So, since it's seven o'clock, I'm gonna take a minute. We're gonna do a little commercial right here. Hey, Palm Boss Magazine, you guys know the drill. I'm not a real good salesman, but I'm gonna tell you this. Palm Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year. Cheaper than a Friday night date. I, I left I left the 19th hole at 616, hooked it over here to our house, got here just in time to go on the air, and I guarantee you I left my wife a bill that's over 35 bucks. <laughs> and she'll be here a little bit, and she'll tell me all about it. But. Palm Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than that date I just had with my lovely bride and our neighbors and got to see Patrick Clayton. But uh, there's a nugget in there, every issue for you. There is. The uh, other sponsors, uh, I love, I got to spend some time at Purina Mills last week looking at their at their um, research farm lake and we're gonna do an electrofishing survey there in early June. Purina Mills, one of my favorite things about them is they have, over the last few decades, been able to establish a relationship where they actually listen to me, and they listen to you. You know, Kenny, Kenny Sanderson, they've listened to Kenny. I don't know if he knows it or not, but they have. You know, and they're, and they're trying to figure out best ways to get distribution out there. But I'm going to tell you this. I, I, there, are, uh, there are great feeds out there, great fish food. I love Purina Mills because I have grown some giant fish probably 40 miles away from Tommy Lineberger right now is a lake where I've grown some bat, uh, bluegills over three pounds and Bruce Condello has caught them and we've shocked some of them up. Bruce has caught a three pound, four ounce bluegill in a lake that we managed where I guarantee you that fish got that big eating Purina game, a Purina um, like 500 or 600. And now we have MVP. Texas Hunter products. I love Chris Blood. I love Texas Hunter. I love all those guys. Their products are stellar, but their customer service is even better. The products can't be beaten, and their service is just unstoppable. I mean, I can order fish feeders, and they'll be out the door that day if I get it in there before 2 o'clock. Uh, Easy Docks of Texas. David Schneiderman, great sponsor. You've got several resources, not just not just this Facebook Live that we archive to a YouTube and link from the Palm Boss website, but at palmboss.com, you can also go there. We've got a really fertile Ask the Boss discussion forum that's been going for 20 years now. There's over half a million posts, uh, and I guarantee you there's not many questions that haven't been asked and answered at Ask the Boss. And the, the moderators, oh my gosh, those guys are great. Uh, Dave Davidson watches this show from time to time. He's one of the, he's the very first moderator that we put on the, uh, the, on the Ask the Boss forum back in like 2005. Give me to tell you that story one of these days over a beer and a fire pit. Um, and then there's a lot of free articles, uh, but I also have the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology if you go to pondboss.teachable.com, you'll see that institute. Now that's a paying gig. You gotta pay to get that. But I'm gonna tell you, if you buy if, if if you're serious about managing a lake, building a lake, whatever, if you've got if you if you just bought some land and you just need to improve your learning curve, that's where you need to go. It costs 495 bucks. But I promise you you will save way more than that in the dumb tax that you'll pay without watching it. I've seen that happen over and over and over and over. So there's my little 
sponsor pitch, including myself. Chris Blood would tell me to do that, even though I'm not comfortable doing it. I've kind of had to get over that. Let's see, um, Sandhill. Okay, here we go. Bruce, does the 10 to 1 ratio improve if you improve habitat? Less energy expended by predators to catch prey. It will improve some. Yes, it will. Because if you've got a couch potato bass, it doesn't have to go so far. But 10 to 1 is about what the ratio is. It actually goes up from that if a, if a predator has to expend a lot of energy. So in other words, if when you start looking at that 10 to 1 ratio of food to gain, and let me explain that because that's really interesting. When you've got, when I'd say it takes 10 pounds of bait fish for a game fish to gain a pound, it takes 10 pounds of bass, I mean it takes 10 pounds of bluegills, shiners, uh, crawfish or whatever for a bass to gain a pound. And part of that's because if you take 10 pounds of fathead minnows or 10 pounds of bluegill and you wring them out, there's about eight pounds of water and two pounds of goodies, you know? And so that being the case, that's where the conversion rate, that's why it's so high. But if that bass has to go 400 yards to eat that 10 pounds and run around everywhere, his maintenance diet is going to be significantly impacting his gaining diet or her gaining diet. So that 10 to 1 can shift if there's a lot of energy be, being expended to go find that food. Now what Bruce does is he's, he's got a pretty unique way for his bass to grow. He's kind of got them feed trained to flesh. So they don't have to run so far. So his conversion rates are probably, it'd be fun to see Bruce one of these days if you can do a little um, conversion ratio of yours, which yours may be way better than 10 to one because your fish don't have to swim, you know, six feet to be able to eat, but they're also not active predators. So the bottom line is this, on fish that are couch potatoes, 10 to one's probably the best. On fish that are having to chase bait fish, go catch shad, whatever they do, it's probably a little bit higher than 10 to one. Hey, Doug Cusick, Matt Marsden. Matt, give me a call, buddy. Um, you got my number. Kevin Demery, very interesting. Yes, sir. Thank you. Wyatt, before we were blessed with some rain, I measured clarity at 14 inches. The color is a brownish green. Normally it's clear, but a lot has changed since then. No plants now, a lot more fish. I didn't fertilize, but I'm wondering if that's okay. Yes, it is okay. Because uh, you're getting ready. I didn't look at, I looked at the radar a while ago. You guys are getting ready to have some more rain. So, yes. Let's see, Justin Ludwig, need varying density of habitat for all fish too. You know, that's a pretty good point. You know, when, I, when I'm designing a habitat plan for a fishing lake, one of the key points that I try to drive home to that landowner is, is you're going to have a handful of key species. And since we're talking mostly about bass here in this show, you got to have the right habitat for bass that are adults. And when I say adults, I'm talking about 14 inches bigger. But a 10-pound bass has different habitat requirements than a 4-pound bass, which has different habitat requirements than a 14-inch bass that weighs a pound and a half, which has different habitat requirements than a 3-inch bass. So the density of that habitat is, is typically related to the species and the size class of that species. So when I'm designing... A underwater and underwater community, I look at the spawning beds first. That's my focal point. So I like to see a three to one slope down to three feet of water and build a spawning bed made of pea gravel for either bluegills, red ear sunfish, or for largemouth bass. And then surrounding that, I leave a little bit of shallow area so that aquatic plants can grow because I know when those baby fish are first hatched, they're going to want to go up into those plants and they can graze periphyte and growing on those plants. And if we've got fertile water, their survival rates go up even more. Then beyond that, we've got some less dense structure habitat. And then beyond that, we've got even less dense structure. So density is pretty much based on that size class of that species of fish. Now some fish, they don't require any structure at all. Threadfin shad, they just want open water and fertility. If they've got that, they're going to do just fine. Largemouth bass, they need a place they can orient to, that, where they can hide, where they can congregate, where they can ambush, where they can reproduce. Bluegill, they have to have a place where they can 
get dart in, dart out. They have to have a place where they can reproduce in colonies. You know, so when you're doing this habitat kind of stuff, those are the kind of things that you things that you think about. So when Justin says you need varying density of habitat for all fish too, that's a good general statement. It's the truth. And the truth of that is that based on the size classes of that species of fish, if you're really going to drill into a habitat plan, then you need to be thinking about density at, at, for different sizes of those different species of fish. There's Billy Granholm checking in 22 minutes ago. Looks like I'm behind. Jerry and me, Duckworth, John Moore. Where do I buy the tools to determine how happy my water is? <laughs> All right, John, that's a good question. I love it. Here's the answer to that. The main things you need to know first is you need to know the water's visibility. That's a Sechi disc. The second thing you need to know, actually, I'm going to reverse those. The first thing you need to know is your water temperature and track that. Write it down. Visibility is next. Clear water is sterile water for fish production. You want some fertility. Another tool to determine how happy your water is is to do a periodic water chemistry test, periodic water chemistry test. You need to know alkalinity. pH is a good thing to know, but pH is a measurement. It's like a ruler. You know, a ruler says, well, its uh, visibility is 18 inches, but that doesn't tell us why visibility is 18 inches. A pH of 7 doesn't tell us why the pH is 7. It's just a measurement. So if you do periodic water chemistry tests with a good lab and you're checking things like alkalinity, hardness, pH, you know, phosphorus, things like that, then you've got a reference point to see and compare how happy your water is. Now, what I mean by that, make that a little bit less complicated, is there's a whole lot of factors that come together that make the water happy. Happy water is water that is vibrant, contacts the atmosphere, doesn't have too much stuff dissolving into it, doesn't have too many plants that influence it, doesn't have too much biomass that consumes the oxygen in it. So happy water is water that is autonomous, meaning that the temperature is consistent and that the pH is consistent, the alkalinity is consistent. Now all those things are influenced both biologically and chemically. And this is not the place to dig into that, but since you asked, where do you buy the tools? Um, you know what? Look at, um, look at boat cycle manufacturing. Um, um, I'll tell you what, dude, go to the Pond Boss resource guide. There's one online, or we can actually mail you a, a hard copy. Here's what that looks like. Here, there's a Pond Boss resource guide. If you're a subscriber to Pond Boss, you get one of these. And inside, it's just loaded with vendors that we have vetted. And there's people I won't let advertise in Pond Boss or be in the resource guide. And it's, it's because their philosophies are different than ours. And you know what? Uh, so be that. I own it. I make those choices. So I'm really comfortable with the people that advertise in the resource guide. It's also at pondboss.com. Rick Kaz. Bob, have you ever heard of adding soy meal to feed fat his? Yes, I have. Uh, fathead minnows, there's Tim Stewart, good to see Tim, Harrison Davis checking in from Georgia, Rick, um, adding soy meal to feed fatheads, you know, fathead minnows are pretty easy to feed, they'll eat cottonseed meal, they eat, they'll eat soybean meal or soy meal, they'll eat fish food, but as long as your water's fertile, it may not be necessary to add something like soy meal. The thing about soy meal that I don't like is it depends on how it's been processed. Because it's, it's, it's sometimes soy meal, depending on how it's been processed, is digestible to fathead minnows, but then again, it might not be, and it turns into a fertilizer. So I'm, I'm not opposed to feeding it. I just think you need to know a little bit more about how that soy meal has been processed. And why are you feeding fathead minnows? If you're feeding fathead minnows to promote uh, reproduction for a brand new stock pond, I'd probably bite the bullet and buy a sack of Aquamax 500, you know, for 60 or 70 bucks and feed that because that has all the nutrition. Soy meal has some of the nutrition. Now, fathead minnows are going to be feeding from, 
what, what they can glean from the water column and graze from periphyte and growing on rocks and plants and, you know, even on the bottom of a pond. So, uh, yes, I have heard of adding soy milk. I don't know that it's a big deal. Hello, Vito. Good to see you, man. Uh, Tommy Lineberger, can feeding by the lakefront homeowners off of docks be a decent source of food for forage? Yes, it can. So, uh, yes, it can. Now, the thing is, is, is like if you have a Texas hunter feeder and it's feeding two pounds of feed a day, you're going to go through a sack of feed about every three and a half weeks, something like that. And their conversion rate on that fish food is going to be like 1.3 because that fish food's dry. You know, the 10 to 1 thing, that's wet food. That dry food, especially that Aquamax MVP, that's conversion rates are going to be more like 1.3 to 1. But even feeding off of a dock in an 80-acre lake, you're supplementing that piece of the population of fish that finds your fish food. So, yes, it is a decent it, it is a decent way to feed forage because, you know, if you can get some solid nutrition into even 40 bluegills, you've increased their ability to, re to reproduce. If you increase their ability to reproduce, then you're going to increase your food chain. So it all just kind of stair-stepped its way in towards success. Okay, Elena is wondering if all the bluegill she catches, what percentage should be big and what percentage should be small? Elena, I love you. That's such a good question. Since you guys have so many bass, your bass are eating a whole lot of your young bluegills. So in a perfect world, the percentage of bluegill that you're catching, I'm going to tell you 30% of your bluegill should be the biggest bluegills. Then another 30% should be the medium-sized bluegills. So if, for example, if you're catching a bunch of 8 to 10-inch bluegills, uh, if you catch 100 of those, 30 of them should be 8, 9 inches long. Another 30 should be 6 to 8 inches long, maybe a little bigger. And the rest of them should be four to five inches long with just a handful every once in a while that are under that, which you're probably not going to catch those because you have so many bass. And you, even though your dad's feeding the bass, they're still making a living eating little bitty bluegills because that's what happens in a pond. Josiah Town, are Missouri ponds around 60 degrees yet? Yes, they are. Um, matter of fact, Chuck's pond last week, I think he said it was 62 degrees and he is near Union, Missouri. So yes, they are. Now you had a little cold front come through. They might have dipped down a little cooler. Is there any drawback to fertilizing and dying upon? Don't die and fertilize. Those are counterproductive. You know, that's like um, that's like uh, pouring Alka-Seltzer in the water then putting some muriatic acid in it. It negates it. So what happens is, is fertilization promotes the growth of phytoplankton in a plankton bloom. What dye does is it limits the uh, ultraviolet rays of the sun penetrating into the water, which stops production or productivity in its tracks. So if you're going to dye a, a, a recreational fishing pond, do that in the wintertime. Don't dye one now. If you want to fertilize now, that can be a good thing. But if you do both, you've negated the effects of both. Hello, Jason Rothamel. Harrison, Tim, I haven't driven by your funeral home service in a while. Oh boy, let's uh, stop in for a cold one. Kenny Sanderson, what about using a bigger, what about using a few bigger cats to help control bluegill on a smallmouth bass, yellow perch, bluegill pond? Well, you know what, Kenny, if if you got a few big catfish to control bluegill, one thing you got to be careful about is they don't grow out, grow outgrow your smallmouth bass and eat them. Now, if you want to grow some six and seven pound channel catfish to kind of help keep your bluegill numbers and your yellow perch numbers in check as your smallmouth bass are gaining and, and growing and getting big enough where they can help do that, that's okay. But you want, the word of caution is, is an eight or nine pound channel catfish will eat a one and a half pound smallmouth. So you got to keep that in mind. You know, um, well, that's really what I got to say about that. Danny Mac, my top line predators are four channel cats. Yeah, his Danny Mac's channel cat are bigger than he is. You know, and Danny Mac's a little bit bigger than a popcorn. Um. <laughs> Steve Lewis. Okay, uh, wait, wait, wait. Steve Lewis, got any books left? Yes, we do. We've got like 850 books left. We've sold like 150 bucks. We've almost covered the print bill. Not quite, but we're getting close. 
So we do have some books left. $29.95, which includes shipping. There it is right there, Beyond the Basics, Fundamentals of Pond Management. And actually, one of the, uh, one of the guys that bought my book uh, texted me over the weekend, and he said, hey. And so I called him. He asked me a couple of questions. I thought, well, heck, I'm going to call him. And I've helped him design a fishing lake in, in, uh, over in Mississippi. So I called him, and he said, okay, tell me about this. Tell me about that. And he says, okay, now in your book, there's a, there's a picture of you and Roger Staubach. Let me see if I can find it right quick. It's a pretty funny story. Where is it? There it is right there. There's a picture of, of, of Roger Staubach and I, and he's holding a red Tootsie Roll pop. Can you see that? Well, there's a pretty cool story about that, and he wanted to know what the story was. So I took about 10 minutes and told him that story, and one of these days I'll tell you, because <laughs> it's a pretty cool story. Steve Lewis, good job. Got any books up? Yep, that's what we got there. All right, Jeff Thompson, stocking a new pond. Using brim one, two, three, four, and five inch in length, does that change the overall total for the pond versus two to three inch brim only? Yes, it does. That changes the dynamics because when you're stocking a new pond, and keep in mind when now when you say brim, I'm presuming you're talking about bluegills. Now, brim is kind of a general term like the word cow. You know, when you say the word cow, that could be Angus, Brangus, you know, Hereford, Brahma. Um, Holstein, whatever. So when you say the word brim, I'm, I'm going to assume you're talking about bluegills. One to two inch bluegills will not reproduce. But what happens with those, this is a pretty cool thing you need to hear. If you take one to two inch bluegills and you stock them into a brand new pond, they're going to grow up in that pond and there's going to be a high percentage of those that thrive in those waters. Now if you take two and a half to three inch bluegills, those are big enough to reproduce. And when you put those in there with those small ones, those two to three inch bluegill are going to start to reproduce, but their growth rates are going to be stymied by the fact that they're reproducing. So keep that in mind. Now, when you're stocking four and five inch bluegill, they're going to be the ones that dominate the spawning beds as those two to three inch bluegill get up to the size and body condition that they can begin to reproduce. All the while, if you stock that those fish, now stock the most small fish, reduce your numbers for the bigger fish. Like if one to two inch bluegills, my recommendation would be to stock, a, depending on your goals, this is totally goal oriented, stock a, maybe a thousand bluegill per acre of the small ones. On the three to four inch ones, you know, 400 or 500 of those per acre are enough. Now if you're stocking them in conjunction, stock a thousand small ones, 300 or 400, three to four inchers, and maybe 150 that are four to five inches. And if you do that, what you've basically done is you've bought the first years, uh, first two years of growth classes of bluegills for that pond. So you'll start to see in another 90 to 120 days, you're gonna start seeing five or six different size classes because those bigger bluegills are gonna spawn. There we go. There's the answer I got for that. Kenny, nothing but good feedback on Purina. Well, the fish food's really, really good. Danny Mack, doing this on the phone at the pond is weird, even if Aubrey's to request to join you on the video. Well, <laughs> so I see that from time to time. I just hadn't had the courage to punch yes. Christopher Aguilar, what if book Bigfoot takes routine bass in your pond? Well, here's the way I see that. If Bigfoot bathes in your pond, then there's going to be a brand new source of food for your fish because they're going to come in and pick ticks and whatever else is growing on Bigfoot. And Bigfoot's, it's, really you should charge him because Bigfoot's getting a heck of a spa deal out of your pond. Danny Mack wants to hear Dave Davidson's story. That's one for a one-on-one -on -one talk. Okay, Michael Eric, hey Bob, missed a bit tonight. Been firing up the feeders in several ponds after work. Put a trail cam on him. There you go, I like that. Steve Thorburn, hey everybody, Pond Boss Farm is great info. Hope everybody's doing great, super. Uh, Drew Schmidt, my pond in Northeast Kansas was 56 yesterday. Mark Dyer, 10 pounds to gain one pound, but how much per pound does the bass 
have to consume to maintain the weight. That goes right back to what I was talking about a while ago. Like what Bruce was asking is it depends on, I tell you what it depends on. It depends on habitat. If that fish has to turn into an Ethiopian long distance runner, it takes a lot more to maintain its weight than it does to gain the weight. So that ratio changes based on the dynamics of that pond. So if you've got habitat that's attractive to bluegill and a bass doesn't have to swim but 10 yards to eat, then its conversion rates are way, way, way better. For instance, if a five pound bass had to eat five pounds of forage per pound, it weighed to stay five pounds and had to eat 10 pounds to gain a pound to become six pounds, that's 40 pounds. Oh, hold up here. My thing's messed up here. Um, a forage, is that how it works or is it 10 pounds roughly maintain and gain that pound? 10 pounds gains a pound. If that fish has to do something else to maintain its weight, then that ratio changes. You know, but if you if you have uh, if you've got super good habitat, ten to one is really a good measurement. Chuck Brinkman, thank you. You are awesome. Well, sometimes I feel awesome. Sometimes I feel sixty-seven. <laughs> Kenny, my cats are twelve to eighteen plus, so probably need to pull them. You know, I tell you what I would do, Kenny. This would be fun if you can catch some of those catfish and lavage them then you can start to see what they're eating. So you can actually catch a big catfish and you can see what it ate without killing it. You know, there's going to be an article in the next issue of Palm Boss that tells you a little bit about lavage, but basically it's it's getting like a, a little, um, it's like a little bilge pump and a five gallon bucket and a sieve. And you can pump water down the gullet of a fish and cause it to regurgitate, which you know, guys, guys like me, we do that. <laughs> Ew, Elena, Elena would do that. Elena, I know Elena would do that. I think, I think Miranda would too. So, uh, uh, you can see what those catfish are eating. Now, one good thing about catfish is you can start to minimize their competition for food by feeding them. You know, if you feed them to satiation with catfish food or 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 MVP or whatever you know, then their predatory, even though their instinct is there, the need will decline. So, you know, I would, yeah, I would sure start thinking about pulling some of them, especially if you think they're eating, or if you can prove that they're eating fish you don't want them to eat. Tom Davis, I've read and recommend the new book. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate that, man. Hey, twenty nine ninety five. There it is right there. 42 years worth of what I know condensed down to 144 pages and probably 40 of those pages are pictures. <laughs> All right. So, uh, holy cow, it's already 728. We're getting time to getting down to the point where it's almost time to start wrapping it up. Harrison Davis, the Pondology course is well worth the time and money. I appreciate that. Harrison, is, Harrison Davis is one of the students on that. So look at uh, uh, pondboss.teachable.com. You can see the Pondology course. If you own land, you, and, and you really want to be a good steward and you want to think about how to come up with a game plan for your lake. And like, Tommy, that's something you may want to look at. It might be worth it for you, as passionate as you are. I've got a, a, like 22 or 23 videos and I'm getting ready to add some more. And so that for $495, that's something that could help you guys begin to figure out how to formulate your game plan. So here we are at 729. We busted to another hour. I got to meet Patrick Clayton. I got to eat brisket tacos. Left the 16th, uh, 19th hole at, at, at 616 and still did this on time. So I'm pretty tickled. Danny Mack, always great to see you. Vito, good to see you. And uh, I always appreciate you guys tuning in. It's a lot of fun. You keep me energized and I do appreciate it. Now, I don't know where I'll be next Wednesday, but I got a feeling I'm going to be hanging out with you. So until next Wednesday, Facebook Live at the Palm Boss Facebook page. We'll see you then. Adios.